Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, in this module I will introduce you to the concept of Orientalism in order to create a context for the popularity of Indian cultures in the era of globalization. We need to go back to the history of the Fed for India in the West that began well before the era of globalization and um, this in order to understand these trends let us go back to an earlier phase and the pr production of a discourse called Orientalism in the West about the non-West that created a desire for the non-West or the East in the West among a group of people. Uh, a discourse that was not just uh, used to represent the East uh, but also constructed the East not only for the Western imaginary but also for the East itself. Uh, we define Orientalism as a term, uh, it is a term used by scholars in art history, uh, literary, geography and cultural studies for the depiction of Eastern that is Oriental cultures including Middle Eastern, South Asian, African and East Asian cultures done by writers, designers and artists from the West. Uh, as I go along, I will be showing you some of these representations, some of these artistic representations which show how the East was depicted in the West. Now the most uh, dominating, uh, the, the most influential understanding of Orientalism has been given by the scholar Edward Said who talks about, uh, who defines it in this manner. He says that unlike the Americans, the French and British less so the Germans, Russians, Spanish, Portuguese and uh, Italians and Swiss have had a long tradition of what I shall be calling Orientalism. A way of coming to terms with the Orient that is based on Orient's special place in European Western experience. So an idea of Orient based on its place in European Western experience produce Orientalism. The Orient according to Said is not just adjacent to Europe. It is also the place of Europe's greatest and richest and oldest colonies, the source of its civilizations and languages, its cultural contestant and one of its deepest and most recurring images of the other. So, in addition the Orient has helped to define or Europe or the West as its contrasting image, idea, personality or experience. Yet none of this Orient is merely imaginative. The Orient is an integral part of European material civilization and culture. Now, Orientalism is a style of thought based upon ontological and epistemological distinction between the Orient and most of the time the Occident. The phenomena of Orientalism as I study it, Edward Said says, deals principally not with a correspondence between Orientalism and Orient, but with the internal consistency of Orientalism and its ideas about the Orient despite or beyond any correspondence or lack therefore with a real Orient. So this Orient as we know or Orientalism is a discourse which is a figment of the West's imagination. It is created without any reference, uh, without, it has no correspondence with the real Orient but it is a discourse about the East which is produced in the West. A discourse about the East in the West produced by Western scholars which tends to elevate a certain Eastern past, past over the others, other past and uh, constructed this Orient or the East as an or alterity to the West by calling it the Orient and by creating an, uh, an idea about the East which was seen as an alterity to the West. Now this East 
uh, is primitive, savage, superstition laden, but also beautiful, noble, closer to nature. So it's not necessarily a negative image, but it's an image which does not have cor any correspondence with the real East. And it's used mainly to define the European self. So this idea of the Oriental other, the East as the other, is used basically, uh, essentially, for your by Europe to define itself. So we have uh, several phases of Orientalist study, Orientalism. It doesn't begin with Edward Said, even though he defines it. We look at 19th century and the study of Eastern culture, religion, philosophy, and mysticism, art, music, poetry, and painting in the 19th century in the West. And it takes off from the Romantic project and the idea that uh, it, the Judo Christian thought and the cold materialism of enlightenment, enlightenment made many Europeans seek for a lost spirit in the promised land of India. So the search for a childlike innocence, a vision of wholeness, a yearning for the recovery of what the poets and philosophers of the period felt the age had lost, namely a oneness with humankind, a oneness with nature, and for a reunification with religion, philosophy, and art, so sent several scholars on an eastern journey. And some of these, uh, now what was the image of the East and the West uh, prior to, uh, by the major thinkers of the West uh, until recently? Uh, we have some representative figures, James Mill for instance, who said that the East had no idea, particularly about India, it had no idea of any system of rule different from the will of single person. Uh, appears to have entered the minds of them. And for Hegel, Eastern unreflective consciousness made plain that it was Europe that absolutely the end of history. So Asia was the beginning. Asia had no history, no culture, no civilization. This was Hegelian's view. So at its core, the Orientalist paradigm was formed, informed by 19th century theories of progress, whereas where the West was seen as a telos, of human development, whereas the East produced great civilizations in the past, but was destined to decline subsequently. This mode of presenting the Orient converse conveniently justified the Europe's colonial rule over in inferior cultures. So this was the rationale for the civilizational mission and the need for Europe to uh, civilize uh, the need for Europe or the white man to civilize natives and the colonized people. Now, there is an imaginative geography of Orientalism, and in this imaginative geography, India is seen as a spiritual, degenerated, caste ridden, um, collectivist, holistically religious los locus that has no coevalness co with the West. So, in the ev evolutionary scale, uh, India is at the beginning and the West at the end, uh, and there is no coevalness between India and the West uh, in the imaginative geography of Orientalism. At its worst, Indian Indo Orientalist discourse has equated Indian present and past and has Im imagined India as a time in a timeless vacuum because India is not supposed to have any history. And India that is essentially ancient and stagnant. So, as I said, Orientalism picks up a particular past and shows it as a real past of a particular society. So the real India is believed to be essentially ancient and stagnant and if there has been any change in India, it has been imagined to proceed towards degeneration, particularly with the Mughal rule. So at this stage, Orientalist protagonists included people such as travelers, thinkers, novelists, philosophers, and colonial administrators who developed a deep affection towards the Orient and mass mesmerized by its exoticism. But most remain ignorant about the inner diversity and texture of Eastern societies. So it wasn't necessarily a negative discourse. It was very positive, but it tended to exoticize those. There were people who loved India and those who hated India, but those who loved India also presented it in an exoticized manner, so that it was far removed from the real India. And these included uh, opinion makers like novelists, thinkers, philosophers, and administrators but they didn't really understand what India is. 
So the first person, uh, we uh, don't begin really in the 19th century, we begin earlier because the first person who studied, uh, the first schol German scholar of Sanskrit was a German scholar, Heinrich Roth, who became fluent in India during his, uh, fluent in Sanskrit during his stay in India and the first person to write a grammar on the language which has, was never published. The real beginnings of study, Sanskrit study, but did not take off until the beginning of the 19th century, making Germany the first European country after the British to introduce the subject at universities, where scholars devoted themselves to translating antique religious texts and poetry. So the Orientalist project was uh, pan-European. It was not just confined to the British who colonized India, but also spread to other European nations such as Germany. In this discourse, the ancient wisdom of India, especially Brahmin and Hinduism, have been seen as treasures for the nation to draw on and on which the soulless West should emulate to rise from its dec decadence. So India is a model. India is an alterity. An ancient India based on Sanskrit language and Brahminical wisdom is seen as a panacea for all the soullessness of the modern uh, of the West. Some of Germany's first Sanskrit scholars were famous personalities such as William von Humboldt. Humboldt corresponded with Hegel with whom he discussed the Bhagavad Gita and we saw that Hegel said that India had no philosophy, no religion, no history and there were these dialogues taking place between the philosopher Hegel and the German scholar Humboldt. Back then it was clear that Sanskrit would not become a language for the masses, it was rather a discipline for a limited number of insiders. The German Indologist Max Müller, who is very well known in India, <laughs> a courtesy the Max Müller Bhavan where one can learn um, uh, through the Goethe Institutes in India which are called Max Müller Bhavan, although he never travelled to India, instead lived in Great Britain for over 50 years, he became famous for the first German publication of the most holy of Hindu texts, the Rig Veda. No one before him had dared taking on the complicated Rig Veda. To this day, Müller is considered to be a visionary and possibly the most talent, ta talented Sanskrit scholar of all time. His 50 volume translation of holy Asian books, sacred books of the East continues to impress and baffle scholars. And I'm happy, no, I'm, I'm, um, I would like to inform you that IIT Library has uh, had um, copies of this 50 volume translation of Max Muller's Sacred Books of the East. So essentially our idea, our understanding of the Sacred Books of the East comes from some of these translations. In 1808, August William Schlegel published his famous reference book titled On the Language and Wisdom of the Indians. In 1818, he became the first professor of Indology at Bonn University. Even the poet Friedrich, Friedrich Rueckert, who had been an expert on Arabic and Persian, also studied Sanskrit and made a name for himself with the translation of the Mahabharat legends. Some works by German philosophers and poets such as Johann Wolfgang von Goethe Arthur Schopenhauer and Friedrich, Friedrich Nietzsche also mention Sanskrit words and are thus proof of the Sanskrit mania of the time. Now from Germany, let's move to India and to the British. Uh, it was the British, however, the colonial rulers who formally created the subject Indology, which is still studied in several universities in, uh, in Europe, including Germany. Um, at the end of the 18th century when the English scientist William Jones founded the Asiatic Society of Bengal in Kolkata in 1784, but prior to that there was a market for Sanskrit, albeit a small one. So Indology, what is Indology? Indology or South Asian studies is the academic study of the history and cultures, languages and literatures of the Indian subcontinent, not India but the Indian subcontinent. The academic study of the history and cultures, languages and literatures of the Indian subcontinent. So it need not be just Sanskritic, most specifically the modern day states of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Nepal and the eastern parts of Afghanistan and is a 
subset of Asian studies. Now, with the help of Romantic Orientalism, Indian now we look at the impact of Orientalism on Indian nationalism as we as I said in the beginning that this idea of the Orient which was constructed by the West uh, uh, the uh, as an idea which was uh, in which the East or the Orient served as an alterity to the West everything that the West was not um, both positive and negative images of the Orient uh, which exoticized uh, the Orient as well as demonized the Orient as savage and primitive, but also saw it as beautiful, closer to nature and innocent. Now, these images were essentially constructed by Europe to define itself, to, uh, to answer a crisis within Europe, a crisis uh, uh, it used. Uh, it, the crisis about where European civilization was heading led Europe to turn to the East in order to define itself, where East uh, through appropriating, where, where the East was seen as an answer to the, uh, to, to the decay or the de decay or the soullessness of European civilization. But the fallout of this Orientalism was that since most of the studies of India or of cultures of the Indian subcontinent were began first formal studies I am talking about, they began in the West by uh, they were done by European scholars such as in the, those scholars in Germany and in Britain and um, British in India. The, the understanding of uh, and uh, the, this production of uh, Indian past, for instance, uh, an ancient B Indian B past based on the Vedic corpus and Sanskrit language. As the real Indian past, uh, this was the contribution of the Indologists and the Orientalist scholars. It had a deep impact not only on the uh, Western imagination of in uh, Western understanding of India, but also the same idea which was used by the West to civilize the East by showing that uh, the East, the, the logic that East had degenerated following the Mughal invasion and the real culture of the East, the ancient Indian culture was lost. The same discourse was used by nationalist scholars. It was first internalized by national scholars who also uh, became complicit in affirming uh, this, confirming the idea of the real Indian past as the Hindu Sanskritic Vedic past and use this past to construct, to instill a sense of pride among, uh, during the nationalist movement among ordinary Indian people that India and to drive out to see, to construct the idea of an ancient India as the real India and to show that uh, uh, it's, it was a British rule which had caused it, that was taken, w that was a fallout of this, that it was uh, in the ancient Indian civilization sank or uh, was lost because of the series of invasion, first the Mughal and then the British. So, without, with the help of this romantic orientalism, Indian nationalism has performed a sort of orientalist judo move to use the force of Orientalism to serve its own purposes. The Anglo-Saxon Orientalist depictions of India were turned around and used to construct a discourse where the West, so there was as is uh, in opposition to West an understanding of the Orient, a construction which was entirely a Western construction. The East constructed its own construction of the West as a, the Occident through creating a discourse about the West, which was where West was seen as immoral, strange in its individualism and indulging in materialism without spirit. So, the essence of the nationalist movement, the pr production of a mystical, spiritual, uh, non-materialist India, which was seen as an alterity to the materialistic, immoral, individualist West was um, a smart master move, one can say, by the nationalist leaders to cr create an Occident uh, in the in the image of uh, the Orient con constructed by uh, Indologists and Orientalist scholars to reverse the exoticization of the Orient uh, of the East by the West. And 
in the module in the units that follow we would be looking at how these in new in this interest in India uh, or Indian languages as, such as Sanskrit or Indian um, texts such as the Vedic texts which began um, as early as the 17th century as in Roth's and uh, understanding of uh, uh, Sanskrit, these ideas carry over. So, th there seems to be several movements one can say where uh, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fad for India and India which is produced by the orientalist or Indologist imagination, a fad through which an image of India as spiritual uh, uh, communalistic and uh, mystical is produced and used by the Euro by a European self or Euro by European societies or Euro American societies in crisis to solve their resolve their own crisis in identity. From time to time, these images or these uh, represent Orientalist uh, Orientalist images of India have been invoked by the Euro by, by Europe and Europeans to. Uh, to reconstruct itself, to redefine itself, a wave which began in the 20s, in the 60s, and in the 90s, and we'll be looking at these. The, the we'll be focusing largely on the 90s wave, but we connect these 90s wave, the post-globalization wave, or uh, the fad for India in the West, the trend for India in the West, by examining earlier waves like the 1920s waves wave. Uh, Orientalist wave or the 1960s wave, where there was a similar interest in India in the West.